so when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. As we are going through the book of Luke, we are seeing the perspective of Luke, who was not a disciple of Jesus, but he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, and he wrote especially for the Greeks so that they would understand what it was that this Jesus was all about. And so today we're going to look at the section of when Jesus was beginning to deal with the issues for his disciples that were absolutely necessary for them to understand. And it's, we're his disciples, so it's important for us to understand them too. I've entitled today's message, The Disciples' Path, Luke 6, 12 through 26. And we will start with verse 12. Remember, this is my translation of the book of Luke. And so you, it's good information for you to have your Bible open in front of you so that you can compare the two. It says, about that time, this was right after Jesus was getting in trouble with the Pharisees and certain scribal scholars for healing a man on the Sabbath, and they were upset, and they were talking about how they could deal with him. And it says, about that time, he went out to a mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he called his disciples and selected 12 of them, who also he named apostles. So we are talking about Jesus now. He's in the midst of being examined by all the religious leaders. There's growing opposition to what he was doing, and he starts to call together those from among his disciples who would be the ones that would carry his message beyond the cross and the resurrection. Jesus' plan was to raise up a body, and so he needed to have leaders. He needed to have those who had been with him and he had poured into. He needed to have those who would take the message of life that he was releasing and that would spread it after he had ascended into heaven and deposited the Holy Spirit in them and given them power. So Jesus was spending the night in prayer. We do not have any other example of Jesus spending an entire night in prayer. That tells you about the significance of what he was about to do. He was calling together those who would be sent on a mission for him and whose lives from this point on would be consumed by that mission. It was all about training from here on in. He was preparing to make a decision for the future of the Christian church as the ages transition from the first covenant to the age of the church, to the new covenant that he was initiating. And he called together his 12 apostles. He named them or called them apostles. The word apostle means a sent one. It wasn't even used that much in Greek culture. It's like Jesus took this very little used word and he made it into a word for the church. Those who are sent with his authority, those who are sent with his power, those who are sent to represent him as they go out into the world. That's what he was doing. Simon, this is verses 14 through 16, tells the, it tells the names of the disciples. Simon, whom... He also named Peter and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Simon who was called the Zealot, Judas son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. So we've got the 12 disciples named here. The first four are very familiar. Uh, Peter, who's also called Simon, Jesus gave him the name Peter. His brother Andrew, who, by the way, in some of the lists is not right next to him, um, he ends up after James and John, because James, Peter, James, and John were like Jesus' closest intimate friends. Andrew was then usually connected because of Peter. So Simon, his brother Andrew, they were fishermen. These four guys were in the fishing business together, James and John, the son of Zebedee, and Simon, or Peter and Andrew, who also were partners with them in the fishing business. By the way, the name James um, in the Greek language is Yaakov, and uh, it's Jacob. 
However, coming through the French language to the King James Version, Jacob was uh, changed along the way because of French French enunciation to James. And so we usually follow the... Because if you started talking about the disciple Jacob, no one would know what you were talking about. And so we follow the King James Version of translating uh, the name Jacob as James. So you've got the four guys that are fairly familiar, and then you've got some of the guys that are very, they're not mentioned much. Philip is mentioned in one of the Gospels quite a bit. Uh, Philip, the Greek word simply means lover of horses. It's just a common, it doesn't mean he loved horses. It means he got a name that meant lover of horses. Bartholomew, Matthew we know because he was the tax collector. Thomas was involved, obviously very loyal. He said, let us go to Jerusalem so that we might die with him. He's also the one who was so obviously depressed that he would not believe that Jesus was still alive after the resurrection until he had seen him himself. He thought the disciples were probably undergoing some kind of mass solution or something like that. Um, Then we've got the last four, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Uh, James, son of Alphaeus, um, not related to Matthew. We talked about that already because Matthew was also the son of Alphaeus or Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Simon the Zealot, the, the word zealot at that time didn't refer necessarily to one of the zealots, political zealots who were around a little bit later. Certainly could have been. Uh, But they also would call someone a zealot who was as zealous zealous for the law as Phineas was for the law when he was the one who went out and began to take care of the problems that happened when Israel got out of control. If you remember what Phineas did, he went around and uh, took care of the guy with the Midianite woman in the tent. So uh, the... uh, So Simon the Zealot may be talking about his zeal for the law rather than a political zealot. Judas, son of James, uh, that's probably, in in other lists, that's Thaddeus. Um, They had multiple names. Obviously, we know they had multiple names. Simon, Peter, and Levi, and Matthew. So we know that they had alternate names and nicknames often. And then Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot, uh, the... Iscariot could mean from Kerioth, which was a village in Judea, or it could mean the false one. could mean either one. We don't know, though. And so most people will take it as being from Kerioth rather than saying that was already describing his motives. Next verses, after we get through their names. He went down with them and stood on a level area. There was a large crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea, Jerusalem, and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Those who suffered from unclean spirits were being cured. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was going out from him and healing everyone. Okay, so uh, this talks about he sets aside, he calls to himself 12 guys. He says, now follow me, and they walk down to the crowds. Now, by the way, if you were one of these 12, what an incredible calling that you had been called to. But it's very interesting to me that each and every one of us has been given an incredible calling. Because even though there were the 12, um, Jesus went out of his way to point out that when we are serving him, we're all equal. There isn't a lot of... um, You know, this one is more valuable than that one is more valuable than that one in the kingdom of God, in the the church. It's just, we are all, we have different functions. Some of us are, you know, called to do certain things. Some of us are called to do other things. But we all have significant roles in the kingdom. And the problem with the church has been when the Nicolaitan spirit has overcome the church. The Nicolaitan spirit, that means conqueror of the laity, conqueror of the people. And in the church, we've had problems when that spirit comes in and it conquers the people and they somehow think that they have less access to God than their leaders. And that is, that's like an Old Testament model. The, the leaders back then, you know, the high priest could walk in once a year right into the Holy of Holies. He had more access to God. It was a representative type of thing that the Lord had set up. In the church, we are a royal priesthood. 
All of us have access to God, and we don't have access to God through someone else except through Jesus. Obviously, through Jesus, we have access to the Father, but that is an intimate personal relationship. And as God's people, when we look at the list of apostles, we say, Lord, thank you for the work they did and what you did through them. But we have significant calls in the kingdom of God, and we need to walk in those calls because if we don't walk in our calls, what they were called to do will not reach its fruition or its completion. Their calling was to build a church that would result in what we're doing today. And we need to do our job so that all of the work that they did is able to be accomplished and to have a purpose. Okay, so, I don't remember if I read this already, did I? Did I get down to the part where the whole crowd was trying to touch him? I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to start over. He went down with them and stood on a level area. There was a large crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea, Jerusalem, and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Those who suffered from unclean spirits were being cured. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was going out from him and healing everyone. That's an interesting little party going on. Jesus comes down the mountain. He's selected the 12 guys that are going to be with him. There's others around. They meet in this level area. By the way, it's very important that we understand this is a level area because Jesus is about to launch into something that sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. However, the Sermon on the Mount, according to Matthew, took place on a mountainside. And so this is not the Sermon on the Mount. However, it certainly has a lot of the touchstones of the Sermon on the Mount. It's very clear the Sermon on the Mount was aimed at a particular audience different than this audience and that it was in a different geographic location. By the way, if you're an itinerant preacher, you repeat the same messages over and over and over again wherever you go. When I travel internationally, and I, as I right now I... When I introduce myself at places like the Chamber of Commerce and people are wondering what you're doing, I say, I'm the, I'm the president of a not-for-profit corporation called New Dawn Ministries. And one of the things that we do ever since the Iron Curtain fell is we go into countries in Europe. And what I do is I help build infrastructure and I help build ministries in ministries and organizations. And I'm somewhere around 80 transatlantic trips right now where I go in and I'm able to do that and to be able to help people. Okay. Now, I have some messages that I share virtually every time I go into a new place. Okay. I could share it in my sleep. And that's anybody that travels into new locations because there's certain things that God gives you that you need to impart to people. And so as I go to these new locations, as I help them, oh, and then by the way, when I'm introducing myself, I say, I'm also the pastor of New Dawn Community Church in my spare time. So uh, there's a different, you understand, if you say they're the pastor of New Dawn Community Church, they go, well, that's nice. But if you introduce yourself for some of the things that you do and they start to think, my goodness, this is, this is way above, beyond, above and beyond what I understand, um, that, that is a, a different way of people looking at what a kingdom-oriented church does. And it's all about helping people understand kingdom. So anyway, this, this Jesus obviously went into different settings in different locations and just like any itinerant preacher, anybody who travels, shaped his message for the audience and applied it to them in ways that they needed to hear. And it was same, the same themes he would hit over and over again. That's one of the reasons why some of the sayings in the Gospels that Jesus says, that they are a little different from one Gospel to the other. It's because they were probably being quoted, quoted at two different times. Because he shared these same things over and over and over again as he was inculcating them into the crowds. So Jesus comes down the mountain. He's on a level place. He's not on the Sermon on the Mount location. There's a large crowd of his disciples there. That's key, his disciples. It's not just the 12. There's a large crowd of people who already were following him. They already were connected to him. And he runs into them. It wasn't only them, though. There was... 
a multitude, a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, and all those other places. So there were many disciples involved in this, as well as many others. By the way, from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, it means probably Gentiles. That there were even Gentiles in the mix who had heard about Jesus. We know about the woman, the Syrophoenician woman that was healed in that area of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. You know, when Jesus touched, reached out to her. And uh, so we understand that there were Gentiles. Whenever Jesus was in the area of the Decapolis on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, there were Gentiles there. That was a, those were Greek cities. And so he was involved. And they were there to hear and to be healed. Isn't that interesting? Why were all the crowds there? Because they were there to hear what he said. We often think they were only following him because he was healing them, but they wanted to hear the message of life too. Here's a guy that was, had the power to bring healing, but he also, they wanted to know what it was that... that, that energized his healing so they came because they wanted to hear him because they wanted to be healed it says that those with unclean spirits were being delivered by the way we talk a lot about unclean spirits demonic spirits but the reason they were unclean is because they made the people ceremonially unclean if you were Jewish and you had an unclean spirit, it meant you could not participate in Jewish ceremonial life. And, and uh, someone who is under the influence of an unclean spirit would be someone who would you know, just do inappropriate things and call out, just doing everything they can to disrupt what God is doing. And so, but they were automatically excluded from Jewish life because of the fact that they had this unclean spirit and it says um, they were being cured just left and right and by the way the word is cured they were cured of this unclean spirit it's interesting because luke as a physician is very clear that there were physical maladies that needed to be healed and there were also demonic maladies that needed to be healed now he was being very clear and specific sometimes when you read from that time you almost get the impression that every physical disease was the result of a spirit of some kind. And Luke is a little bit more careful in how he words things. He was a physician, so he's, you know, he's, he's trying to make sure we understand what he is saying. By the way, it says, look at that at the end, power was going out from Jesus and healing everyone. Remember, a little bit earlier in the book of Luke, we read this. On one of the days Jesus was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law evaluating him, They'd come from all over the place. But it says, the power of the, and power from the Lord was there so that he could heal. And sometimes, and that talks about him being dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we are. And sometimes, he was so filled with the power, it was just flowing out from him. People would just want to brush up against him. That's why when he was in a crowd, they all pressed in on him, because it was a place of healing. The power was going out from him, and they wanted to touch him, like the woman who pressed into the hem of his garment, knew there was power available and could go out from him with a mere touch. And you think, wow, isn't that really interesting? That's because he was Jesus. No, the same thing happened with Paul and Peter. Peter would walk by people and, you know, they, want, they just wanted his shadow to fall on them. Paul, I mean, goodness, he would, have, he would send handkerchiefs and they would heal people after he'd been in contact with them. And so this is not something that is, you know, a sign of who Jesus was. It's a sign of who the Holy Spirit is and that he was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure on our behalf. So the, again, this is not something that we, as we look at, say, huh, Wow, that's interesting. It must have never happened again. Yes, it did. And when God's people are pursuing him, it happens, is right. So, okay. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. This is a key phrase. Then he directed his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are hungry now, for you will be fed until you are full. Blessed are you who are weeping now, for you will laugh. Key phrase. Focus on the disciples. He lifted up his eyes and he looked at the disciples. This is a very formal Greek phrase. He lifted up his eyes to focus on the disciples, to look at them, to see them. It means everything he's about to say next is aimed at his disciples. It's not aimed at the world. Same that his disciples. In the book of Matthew, it says that his audience was everyone who had gathered together. And as everyone is gathered together, Matthew makes it extremely clear the things that Jesus says. We'll talk about some of those differences. But because of the fact that Jesus is focusing on 
only his disciples that had already been with him for a season, he's able to say things to them in a different way because of their experience with him and their understanding of how his kingdom worked already. So, the first thing he says is blessed or blessed, fortunate, happy. That's what the word means. It just says this is someone who has good things happening in their life. And the first phrase makes you think, ha, really? Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And if you've ever been poor, especially with the word he uses in the Greek language, it's tokus. And that means you are basically, you don't have two nickels to rub together. I mean, we're not talking, you know, on the lower economic strata in the working environment. We're not talking day labor. We're talking about someone that doesn't got two nickels to rub together. That's Pilka's poor. This was the people that were the absolute people on the very bottom who are saying, I mean, who are not saying, who have nothing, no resource, and are absolutely dependent. Now, by the way, that's not the way you're supposed to be in the kingdom of God. You're supposed to work hard with your hands. We got clear teaching on that. We, we know as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're supposed to work hard with our hands to support ourselves, to support our families. In fact, if you don't support your family, you're worse than an unbeliever, Paul says later. So we understand there's clear teachings that define to us, and by the way, not just to support ourselves, support our families, to be able to share with others. And obviously to be able to honor God with. So we're well aware of the fact that we're supposed to be people who work hard with our hands. Keeps us out of trouble, by the way. You know, or with our minds, or however it is that we do it. But even if you work with your minds, you're usually typing with your hands. But, but the... Uh, um, anyway, so when you hear this, blessed are the poor, especially these people, if the Greek word is speaking of such, such deprivation, you know there's something else going on. Now remember, these were disciples. Now, by the way, Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, there's, there's a big wide crowd out in front of him. No misunderstanding. Jesus is going to make sure they understand. He's talking about spiritual poverty. People who know that when they come before their God, they have nothing to bring. That's the reason he uses that phrase. They have nothing to bring. They basically come before the Lord on their knees. There's nothing there for them to offer the Lord. The Lord saves them gives them spiritual access because of who he is, not who they are. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But here he just says, blessed are the poor, because he's talking to his disciples. And he already understands what it is that is, as, as he is going forward, just making sure everything's okay here. Okay, good. Anyway, Jesus, they already know what it is that Jesus is talking about. He has already shared with them so much stuff. And I want you to think about a minute about what it means to be poor and just poor. Blessed are the poor. Why would Jesus say that? Blessed are the poor. Well, Jesus said about the kingdom of God that it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Think about that. You know what? It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, remember what the kingdom of God is. He's not talking about faith. He's not talking about a relationship with God. He's talking about someone who will have the tenacity to be able to press forward. Remember, the kingdom of God advances with violence, or, and violence take it by force. Those who have the ability to put down their own self-will, to put down their own needs, their own requirements, and say, Lord, I am here for you. I want to manifest your kingdom. The kingdom of God starts on the inside. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, and then it goes to the outside where it manifests in power that God wants us to be able to share with the world in which we live. But we know very clearly from the first time Jesus began sharing about the kingdom that the kingdom would not advance unless those with a forceful mindset of putting aside their own comforts, unless they were the ones who were involved doing it. 
And so Jesus said, blessed are the poor. He's obviously speaking about the poor in spirit, but he's saying blessed are the poor. In one way, there is blessing to be poor because you don't have all those comforts standing between you and the kingdom. That doesn't mean that someone who's poor couldn't have the same lack of self-will to be able to step into the things of God, but he's saying at least there's not one obstacle for you if you're poor. The obstacle of being so comfortable that you will not press forward into the kingdom. It takes one obstacle out of the way. Now, by the way, Jesus is talking to a group of people that if they would have seen the poorest people living in the United States, I'm not talking about the homeless, I'm talking anybody that has a home, anybody that has a place they rent, any place that has a, place, a, a, a modern place where they lay their head, they would have thought we are the most wealthy people in the entire world. Just having a refrigerator. Just having a refrigerator makes us among the most wealthy people that have ever lived. Kings, emperors. In order to have refrigerated goods, some of the emperors, we hear stories where they would send routine patrols up to the mountaintops to bring down snow. But only the wealthiest could afford that. And we get to go to our refrigerators and stick a cup underneath the ice cube maker. A little bit of water. Refreshing. We are so wealthy in the world in which we live. We are able to communicate with people across distances that boggle the mind. We're able to see them in person. I mean, not in person, but video of them as we talk to them, which means the separations, which were so much a part of their culture. We, we don't have to have the, you know, the, we can talk to people face to face through our video screens. So the idea that, you know, when Jesus talks about the poor without two nickels to rub together, he's talking to his disciples, they understood. He's saying, guys, keep on going forward in spite of your comfort, in spite of how wealthy you are or become, keep pressing in because you want the kingdom of God. And he's giving a warning to his disciples that along the way they're going to come into place where they are going to be just comfortable and sedate and that inner drive which had motivated them to violently put down their self-will, that's going to kind of get a little bit calmed down. Remember when you first got saved? You wanted to convert everyone, right? Okay. What changed? Well, we get used to our condition. We get used to everyone around us. We get used to our relationships. We get used to our nine to five. We get used to our, I mean, we get used to things. And so what happens is we change. And that's, by the way, there's some wisdom in how we do things. Because, of course, a lot of times, some of the people that are most annoying are the brand new saved ones because they just wear you out. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's just, come on, let's charge. And we go, no, let's walk. Because... Thank God there's that mixture. Brand new people that are saved spur everyone on in some really good ways. So anyway, blessed are the poor. He drops out in, you know, the poor in spirit because he's talking to his disciples. He doesn't need to discuss that with them. And uh, they get the message. He says, hey, blessed are the hungry. And by the way, in the book of Matthew, he says those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Obviously, that's what he's talking about. There's not a whole lot of blessing in uh, not having any food. But when the food you're seeking is God's truth, there's a great blessing in it. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Hungry disciples are going to be fed rich food. And he, that, that's the, he's looking at his disciples and say, stay hungry, stay hungry. What's the problem? Disciples get content. He's saying, don't get to the place that you are so content that you're one of the guys that, can't, that, that have a hard time going through the eye of the needle and you can't get to the kingdom. Stay hungry for God because if you stay hungry for God, you're going to get fed. And then he said, blessed are those um, who are weeping now for you will laugh. You look at the state of the world and you stay sensitive to its need. That causes, that's that weeping mindset. You look at the world and you don't let the veneer of the world cover up the need which is out there. And you're in touch with the reality of it. You're going to weep now, but eventually when you see what God's going to do, you're going to laugh. Because life's going to be released. Next verse is, blessed are you when men hate you. That one's always a fun one. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you and slander you as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and dance for joy, for take note of this, 
Your reward in heaven is great, for their fathers treated the prophets in the same way. Okay. When men hate you. Isn't that great fun? Um, Jesus is saying, pay attention. If you are going for the kingdom of God as one of my disciples, there are going to be some people that hate you. That's the way it is. And he's making a general statement to his disciples about this. In fact, later on he's going to say, if that's not the case, you're not really doing your job. Think about that. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you and slander your name because of Jesus. Now, by the way, you can be a jerk and have people exclude you and be angry at you and, you know, slander your name. But he's talking about when you're actually serving Jesus, when you're taking stands based upon your faith in your Savior. That's the type of thing that he is talking about. And when that happens, he says, great is your reward in heaven. That, by the way, is supposed to encourage you to be able to put up with it. When there are people who oppose you because of your faith in Jesus and the stands that it causes you to take, great is your reward in heaven. You know, there are things that we can take a stand for today, just, and we don't talk about it as much anymore because it's a battle that is so difficult with the courts, and, but uh, the whole topic of abortion... Okay, just take a stand in a public place and say, I don't believe that abortion is right. Find out how people speak about you. Okay? You know, I, 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 just, I know how this works. When I talk about it, when, I, when someone asks my opinion, I say, hey, listen, I'm a Christian clergy who believes that every life is valuable. Of course I've got grave concerns about abortion and the easy access to it. I have grave concerns that the majority of abortion clinics in the United States of America are in minority neighborhoods. I have grave concerns about the, the, uh, why that is. Why would we do that? I know that the founder of Planned Parenthood was a, an avowed racist and a, a, a eugenicist. I, I know all that stuff. And so I'm wondering if that spirit doesn't still linger and that there's more of an agenda in, that, in, in what they're doing than any other agenda. I'm, I'm, those are concerns to me. But if you bring that up, and besides the fact that I, you know, I don't want babies to lose their lives, I want them to step into life because that's God's plan for them. If you bring that up, there are a great deal of people who will... Do everything they can to shred your reputation. It's the way it is. And yet we have to stand for God's truth. We have to stand for life. He says, hey, when, that, when they come against you because you're taking a stand for me, great is your reward in heaven. You are sharing truth and you're having it. It's, by the way, your spiritual heirs of the prophets. And that's what he said. Listen, um, <laughs> your reward is great for their fathers treated the prophets in the same way. The people that are attacking you, their spiritual progenitors have always attacked God's people. And you're just in a long line of God's people. Don't take it personally. That takes a little growing up, doesn't it? And we, have a, we take things personally. Okay, on the other hand... He's been saying, blessed, blessed, blessed. On the other hand, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> On the other hand, woe to you who are wealthy, for you are receiving your encouragement now. Woe to you who are filled up with food now, for you will be hungry. Woe to those who are laughing now, for they will grieve and weep. Oh, my. Jesus, again, speaking to his disciples, wants them to understand that they, they need to have a little bit of a mindset change because we have a tendency to look at the most wealthy people in our world and to think that they're the most blessed. And Jesus says, well, in some ways, they're the most challenged. Because if you know that, you know, there are people who are in these positions, especially when the age shifts, who was Jesus speaking to? People who were living at the end of the age. Ah, at the end of their age, the beginning of our age. And now we're at the end of our age, and so we can take these words to heart 
in a lot of ways. He's not talking to believers. He's talking to people who are living for themselves in the world. Now he's saying, "By let me tell you what it's going to be like for those who are not disciples, who are living in a particular fashion in the world in which we live. Woe to you who are wealthy, for you are receiving your encouragement now. Okay, now what does that mean? Now, they're... Have you ever been really super wealthy? How's your yacht? <laughs> Yachts are nice, aren't they? If you like water. Otherwise, how's your big airplane? You know, your 747? Maybe you're going to go to Mars. Because you're wealthy. And your money gives you lots of opportunities and a lot of encouragement, doesn't it? Because you're wealthy. You want to go and visit Moscow tomorrow? You can go. I don't know why you'd want to. Paris, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, your money makes way for you because you get to do the things that you want to do. It's very encouraging to be able to make a statement and have the news media just glom onto it and say, this person said this. Your name is Elon Musk right now? My goodness. You have to be careful what you say. He went after Facebook the other day. I imagine that did not help Facebook shares because of all that data issue that's going on right now. You know, you have an encouragement. Everything you say is sought after. Everything you do, you have the ability to do different things. And Jesus says at the end of an age, your encouragement is now. Be aware, because stuff can disappear. Every wealthy person who lived in Jerusalem was going to lose it all. They were going to escape by the skin of their teeth. Do you, do you know what they... No, oh, this is kind of graphic, but... When Jerusalem was surrounded by Titus' army and people started to escape Jerusalem, the rumor went out that the people that were escaping were swallowing gold to smuggle it out. Guess what the Roman soldiers did? Killed them. Oh, yeah. They wanted the gold. Why did they burn down the temple? They wanted the gold. It was gold ornate. They wanted to make sure they got all that gold to, you know, out of the stones. They tore off, they moved all of the stones. They did all that. They were after the gold. It takes a lot of money to run an army. And so they were always looking for the gold. Jesus was saying to the wealthy, you know, at the end of an age, this isn't going to be such an advantage anymore because of the fact that everyone, when you're at the end of an age, there's a leveling going on. Remember, the lights shift. The kingdom in our age is going to get brighter and brighter, and the world and the normal way that we do things doesn't work as well anymore during the shift of an age. Wealth can be lost. Food can be scarce. Woe to you who are filled up with food now, who are not you know, planning for the kingdom where there's going to be a real power that needs to be released. Um, for you'll be hungry. And woe to those who are laughing now with any care, without any care or concern because, because they don't have a sensitivity to the needs of the people. That's why they're laughing. And they'll find out that that is going to be something that can come upon them. Their joy will be lost. And then Jesus says in verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers treated the false prophets in the same way. Okay. If all men speak well of you, you know what it means? If ever, all men, by the way, he's saying all men, okay? It means simply you're not doing your job. You're not, you're not representing the kingdom enough. You're not going after the kingdom in a powerful way. It has not escaped my attention that a lot of the vitriol which is released in the evangelical church, of which we are a part, charismatics are a part of the evangelical church, I mean, it's the church that preaches Christ crucified, the evangel. But a lot of the vitriol that is released against charismatics comes from the evangelical church because of the fact that they don't understand kingdom. Our job is to release kingdom. If you're going to release kingdom, and we need to for the sake of the evangelical church, for the sake of the people that live around us, our job is to bring protection and life to them. And if you are doing that, the very people that you are attempting to release life and light to are going to be the ones that don't speak well of you. And Jesus says, if they are all speaking well of you, 
Well, it's a pretty good sign that you're not representing the kingdom enough. You're not being enough salt and light in the world in which you live. You know the only reason the world knows you exist as a Christian is when you get outside the four walls of your church and you do something to impact the world in which we live. You know, of course, that the world is happy for churches to exist as long as they stay inside their own four walls. That's why would the, the, you're no threat to them. You're no threat to the order of things. And we need, by the command of the Lord Jesus, to be salt and light. He said, if salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for anymore? Just to be cast out on the path and to be trampled underneath the foot of men. Now remember what their salt was. It was mixed with other minerals. And they could have a whole wagon full of salt, minerals, other minerals mixed in. And if it rains, all the sodium chloride leached out, all the salty leached out and so people would say oh look at there's a wagon full of salt and they'd go and it would just be other minerals and be like Bleh. you know what would they do with it they'd put it in the mud holes so that and that's what it means be trampled underneath the there's they'll do it they'll use it for something they'll say what use is this for the only thing it's good for is to fill up the inconvenient places oh boy i could preach on that What's the only thing the church is supposed to do today? Don't say. But in our culture, there's only several, several acceptable things that churches are really supposed to be involved in. Because that's what you do. Don't get outside of those things. If you get outside of those things, then you're a problem. Only do the things that no one else wants to do. Instead of the things that we've been called to do. Well, I guess we've got to break out of this, right? It's the path of a disciple, the disciple's path. We have to be able to break through the mindsets that keep us comfortable. We've got to be, be able to break through the mindsets that slow us down, that stop us from going after and repressing ourself and our comforts and all that. If we're going to be used by God, we have to be able to say to ourselves, you know what, I really don't need to watch TV tonight. I need to go out and do something. I need to release life. I need, need to be able to step out and become what God wants me to be. And we're never going to get there if all we're doing is meeting our comforts. There has to be a part of us that says, you know what, I am, it's more important to me to release the kingdom of God than it is for me to do my routines. And if we do that, we're going to release life in our culture. Obviously, when we... Uh, do our hurricane prayer season, which is, by the way, coming up in June. We all have our prayer meetings again. But when we do our prayer meetings in June, it means if you're going to come out to that meeting, guess what you had to do? You had to, you had to come out of your house after supper to partake in a prayer meeting. Now, that's not a lot of inconvenience, but it's a start. It helps us step outside of ourselves and say, I'm going to do something to be able to release God's light in the way that he has shown us. Anyway, we have a lot that the Lord wants us to step into in the season in which we live. We are in a shift of ages. It's uh, definitely the Lord for us to be looking at this message to his disciples in the time that's in front of us. Next week, of course, we'll be taking a break from the book of Luke and looking at a resurrection story of some sort. Um, and so grab onto this, though. The whole idea of fighting that tendency toward just not being involved. That's what Jesus' whole message was about today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity today to look at your word, to look at your truth, to understand more about how it is that you have called us to be your disciples. I ask that in this shift of ages that you would give us the ability to step into the kingdom by violently putting down our own lack of zeal, our own tendency toward comfort to be able to become what you want us to be. Help us manifest your kingdom on every level. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.